Well, excellent. Why don't we go ahead and get started and give you an introduction, a quick introduction to uh, Comprehending Comprehension, Conversations with Trina and Doug. First of all, what is it, right? It's a little strange. Um, it is a live audience interactive conversation. We want some back and forth, but we've prepared some discussion questions to hopefully have the conversation going. So why did we choose this live format? Well, we wanted something that was informal, that felt conversational, unscripted. We wanted to hear from the community at large and just have a conversation with all of you about these topics. Right. We want people in the conversation that are not just researchers like ourselves, but also the educators that are in the schools, in the classrooms, the SLPs who are there really trying to make a difference. We feel like we're part of the team and want to be part of the team. So having these reciprocal conversations are critical to moving our fields forward. And the way this works is if you have a comment, please raise your hand and we'll notice that or we'll have Megan is joining us also. She is a doctoral student in Florida. She's wonderful and she's going to be helping us. So raise your hand and please feel free to speak up and make your comment. Or you can also use the chat. We'll be monitoring that a lot and we will try to respond to everyone's comments. We really want to hear from all of you. We have a few disclosures to go through. Uh, Doug and I are affiliated with Language Dynamics Group, which is hosting the Comprehending Comprehension um, event. And uh, we are also recording. Okay, so I want to make sure that you know that you can keep your, your cameras on. We love to see your faces during the conversation, it makes it so much more interactive. But if you're concerned about that because we're video recording, that's okay too. So Trina is an associate professor at the University of South Florida in the Department of Child and Family Studies and is an affiliate faculty in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders. And she got her PhD from Utah State University at the exact same time that I did, which is how we know each other. <laughs> That's right. We did all of our arguing back then when we were students. <laughs> <laughs> we mostly got it out of our system. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a fib, huh? We still argue. And actually, if we don't argue for like several months, you know, there's been a big stretch of no arguing, we kind of have to like get together and, you know, say, hey, we got to fight, right? Because <laughs> we get itchy about it. That's just kind of our thing. We don't really fight, but we do argue and debate very professionally. We're still friends after what? We're like going on 15 years or something. It's so, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing you've put up with me that long. Or I've put up with you that long. I'd say the other way around. It's amazing you put up with me. I'll, I'll own that. I, yeah. I think that's right. <laughs> In fact, your students ask me all the time, how have you worked with Doug for so long? <laughs> okay, so Doug is actually a professor at Brigham Young University in the Department of Communication Disorders. He's a very busy man. And he takes off the summer and goes completely off grid to be a commercial fisherman in Alaska. So he is very much at home in, in Alaska and in the back country when he, where he does not need to shower. Like, <laughs> almost at it all. It doesn't mean I don't, it just means I don't need to. <laughs> mm, I think you told me the whole time you were there, like three months, you maybe got in four showers. Well, I hey, it's like true. a really cool climate and it's, you know, it's just, it's a different world up there. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's grungy. <laughs> All right, well, we welcome our audience. Thank you everyone for being here. And I really hope you're excited to talk about this topic. Everybody good? Give me some smiles. Hi, Tiffany. So good to see you. Thank you for turning on your camera. Awesome. All right, well, we picked a good topic today and I hope you guys have something to talk about, okay? so. How this kind of sort of goes is we just start asking questions and hope you guys jump in. You can ask your own questions. You can answer the questions, right? We can have a go back and forth. Again, unscripted conversations about comprehension. So our topic really is, is the science of reading neglecting comprehension, right? Now, I think it's important that we understand what the science of reading really is. Um, does somebody have a good definition for us? Make sure that everybody has a, the same understanding of science of reading. 
<laughs> I think our session is over. Tatiana said, yes, it does. It ignores comprehension. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, wait, Tatiana, do you have a definition of science of reading for us? Just did a presentation yesterday on the over-reliance and particular programs of focus on phonics. So I'm kind of fresh from that, given the fact that there is significant amount of these recommendations for programs, regardless of what assessment showed, there was no assessment done and so on and so forth. But the issue is that the, the idea of the science of reading is not really truly understood. And then there is a great deal of conflation regarding what it is. And then you add the, you know, the phonics, you add the multi-sensory instruction, you add the you know, popular programs and it becomes this ungodly mess, which is very, very difficult to, and then it's very, very difficult to sift through what is left on what science of reading is. Mm. <laughs> That's good, but there might be some people on this conversation that don't even have like a starting definition, even a simplified one, right? Does any, is anyone going to attempt one or if I'm, if not, I guess you guys left to us to do I it. I mean, the systematic and explicit teaching of reading, considering all the skills involved in skilled reading instructions, including phonological and phonemic awareness, orthographic knowledge, semantic knowledge, morphological awareness, reading fluency, reading comprehension, including the multiple components of both reading fluency and reading comprehension from a scientifically based research point of view. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> that was very good. Yeah, it's a body of evidence, right? It's all about the research that's out there. Um, it is used in an in interesting way today. In fact, I just saw on Facebook recently someone posted, is the science of reading copyrighted or trademarked or something like this is like a, uh, I don't know, I don't know, a business or something. But no, it's supposed to just be what is out there, the body of evidence of of the research for science. So, um, wait, I wanna add that it's not just a single body, right? That there are multiple bodies of research and there are multiple sciences about reading, okay? So like there's neuroscience, cognitive science, behavioral sciences, there's really sciences of reading. And Tatiana also mentioned like the instruction. Now the bulk of the science of reading is really about how people learn to read. Right. And what are the necessary components and how do they link together to, you know, build together for reading. But there's like a subcategory of instruction. Like, what does that mean for instruction? However, there's we're probably not uh, we don't have enough a dense or deep enough um, research body on the instruction piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and Kelly brings up this website, what is the science of reading.org, which I am not familiar with. So um, it sounds like it's a really good website. At least it's getting some, you know, some, some support here. Um, so it's something maybe to check out. It's called, uh, and you can, you guys can see it in the chat. So it's called, what is the science of reading.org. And then uh, Tiffany Hogan posted this beautiful piece about the body of of work. And this came from Dr. Louisa Motes, who very much does understand what the science of reading is, at least from my own personal opinion. I happen to love Louisa's work. So thank you for that. I'd like to say that when I think about reading, I've always broken it up into two parts, the mechanics of reading, and then the understanding of what you read. And I agree with you that the science of reading tends to work on the mechanics of reading. Um, and I don't want to say leaves by the wayside, the comprehension, but to me, it's they're two different constructs almost. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't comprehend until you can lift those words off the page. But that's how I look at reading as mm -hmm. two distinct areas. Mm -hmm. Right, Joyce. I mean, what you're describing really sounds like the simple view of reading, which Absolutely. is this fairly simple model that it's really held up across the test of time, right? This idea of decoding and linguistic comprehension and the two constructs conflated together lead to this definition of reading. But the conflation is very real, right? They are and can be somewhat distinct constructs, this decoding idea and then this comprehension idea. So, so yeah. for, those, for those of you who want an upgrade from your simple view of reading, I might reference 
the Duke and Cartwright article that just came out in Reading Research Quarterly. Um, and the reason is because they talk about progressing the science of reading past the simple view of reading and talk about bridging processes that are the ones that there's overlap for. So like there's word recognition, there's comprehension, but in between there's actually things that are bridging them and that are needed for both word recognition and understanding comprehension. Um, and so like those bridging processes, I think there's a lot to still unpack with them, like, but that they definitely play a role and sometimes sometimes we see reciprocal relationships and not them completely and totally independent so that this is an article that i'll definitely include in our in our blog afterward because i think it's highly valuable to really unpack the complexity that's involved in um the science of reading so. And you tend to sing the praises of Nell Duke quite a bit, Trina, when you and I are talking. I haven't read nearly as much of her work as you have, but, um, I, you know, it sounds like she really has a good handle on reading comprehension. Like mm -hmm. you were mentioning that she's like the go-to person when it comes to that. That's who I would go to on reading comprehension stuff. Um, but definitely she's written quite a bit about it. She has, an, she has other pieces. The science of reading comprehension instruction that I really also like. Um, and she has a seminal article that really breaks down the text structures in narrative and expository that's kind of like frequently referenced. I think it's a Duke et al. 2011, something like that. Um, it, it's kind of a go to in, in the field of education around comprehension stuff. So I think like Joyce and Tatiana, they've said, they agree that the science of reading is neglecting comprehension. And I'm gonna say, are they really, is the science really, or is that a practice? Is the application of the science of reading in practice neglecting comprehension versus the science neglecting comprehension? That's my question. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. So I'm, I'm questioning whether the neglect is coming from the science of reading or in the application and the implementation of it in schools. I would argue it's not coming from the science because we're doing a lot of science <laughs> on reading comprehension and language comprehension. Many of us are. Yes, you know. I totally agree with you, Tiffany. But yeah. of course, I, I asked the question. So. <laughs> No. Does anybody does anybody watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? <laughs> okay, so there's this great episode when Mac is asking, you know, the gang, who are we versus? Let's start with that. Who exactly are we versus? Because it's not the research which is ignoring it. It's what's being pro proliferated from the top down. And that becomes a whole other ballgame. Yeah, I think, Tiffany, you probably feel that to your core, right? Being part of the LARC group and doing huge multi-million dollar grant funded studies. And then like, to what extent are those attended to? To what extent are they referenced? I mean, I will say that one of the biggest um, boons I had in my career was being invited to talk to the Reading League. Uh, and, but it was also, I felt the weight of of showcasing this work because it wasn't just my work at all. I was showcasing at all. It was showcasing the body of work and the feedback I got from that talk was primarily right in line with what you're saying. It was, wow, we didn't know all of this was going on. And I think some of it's because our field does that work and our field's not well integrated into the science of reading. That's just my opinion. I think we're doing better, but I'll also say as a major shout out, I mean, that work that we did for LARC, we built on the work you and Trina had done way prior to LARC. So, I mean, it's, I think it's one of those like best kept secrets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so every time I see an article, it says the missing link of comprehension or the missing link, I'm always like, okay, okay, they're going to say it. They're actually going to say language. <laughs> Nobody ever does. Nobody ever does. <laughs> well, I, I also Just think starting to now. It's just starting that the IDA and a lot of other organizations are picking up on a huge importance of poor language plays right. in literacy disorders. Up until right now, it was shouting into the void. And I apologize for whoever I just interrupted. That's, that's okay. I think 
I, I, so I, I come from a reading specialist background. Teaching the mechanics of reading is way easier, in my humble opinion, than, and I, I don't believe you can teach comprehension. I think you have to model it, think aloud. I don't think you can teach a person to think, and reading ultimately is thinking to me. Mm -hmm. And I think we know that there's a big divide between research and practice. And again, you know, I'm familiar with Tiffany's work. Um, I don't think this gets into the hands of practitioners. I, I think. I, I'm, Sorry, again. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I apologize. I don't know what's wrong. No, no, no. Go ahead. But the issue is that the comprehension is not a unitary skill. And a number of researchers have showcased it there beautifully. It's about approximately 17 to 18 different skills. You have to teach all of them. And that's if, you know, reading fluency is intact. We're not even talking about what happens if reading fluency is intact. But in addition to all of that, if foreign language is shot, we're looking at a whole other ball game. So reading comprehension is not one skill. It's teaching approximately 17 to 18 skills, measuring and monitoring them. And that's why it's so difficult to understand, which is one of the reasons why speech language pathologists are so uniquely positioned to work on literacy, provided they have adequate training. That's great. Uh, I'm wondering, Roxanne, did you want to say something? You turned on your camera? <laughs> she's got to get out. <laughs> is Roxanne driving? Is that a car? <laughs> yeah, I think she's driving. Hey, to or maybe she's flying. Okay, no. <laughs> driving. Oh, sorry. I think we lost her too. I'm sorry. Wait, Lance Greener, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, this is kind of an uneducated view um, as far as it goes. And just I think the comprehension, there's a lot of it that might be environmental as well. I know that there's times when I'm reading and, you know, depending on how much sleep I've had or other factors. And so I think that also plays into it. Yeah, Lance, that's huge. Dave, thanks so much for being here, by the way. Lance and I go way back. Um, and I, I, can, right? I can verify the uh, non-showering thing, but I thought that's, that was only the summer after we graduated. So... <laughs> Hey, I take a shower every day in Utah. Let's be clear. Um, <laughs> so it is all about, not all, but there is so much there about background information and experience, which I think is what you're talking about, Lance. This, what you bring to the table when you, when you open up that text, when you're reading it. And that is a huge factor. And that, that also very much connects to Tatiana's comment about how reading comprehension is is an unconstrained skill. Uh, I, I, Melissa Allen, I, a dear friend of mine from University of Wyoming, would always talk about how decoding is a constrained skill. It, there is only so much essentially that there is to learn about decoding and to learn how to decode. And then essentially you get to a point where you are fluent enough to access the code and convert it into language. But that is not necessarily the case with comprehension. Is there ever really a limit to how much we can comprehend and all of the possible background experiences that we could bring to the table? It is so huge, which makes it difficult as Joyce was mentioning, right? It is so much harder to get a handle on what it is that you're even trying to teach because it is so huge. Mm -hmm. I also want you to know that I couldn't find this I'm going to find this figure in a minute, but this is the figure in the Duke and Cartwright article. This circle right here is motivation, engagement, executive functioning, the things that we have to concentrate on to be able to comprehend and to decode, right? So it's a critical piece of their model of reading comprehension. I also want to ask it as kind of a tangent question if, there, if I can't see any other hands, hands raised right now. The tangent question might make you think though, what's the difference between skills and strategies? And is comprehension one of those? Okay, so maybe we don't know the difference. Wait, Joyce, do you know? I would say we teach strategies to become successful at a skill. So to me, the skill is 
the ability to do such and such, but I would teach strategies according to the kids' strengths and weaknesses to get to success at whatever skill I'm talking about. So I see them as very different. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks, Joyce. Did somebody else have a, have a comment about it? So it's somewhat of a trick question, right? Which I'm kind of sneaky at doing that here. But so there's a lot of definitions of the word strategy. Sometimes they're the strategy, like a teaching strategy. We do this, right? Sometimes it means something that is like an intentional step-by-step process that we intentionally apply to a problem. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to dichotomize skills and strategies of that second definition. All right. So a skill is something that we learn and it becomes automatized. Okay. And that we're no longer devoting cognitive energy to applying that skill because we can do it. So like the code, right? Phoneme graphing correspondence, that becomes a skill that's so automatized, we don't even think about it. Whereas in comprehension, there are some strategies that have to be intentionally applied. So for example, um, comprehension monitoring, right? Or rereading or checking back right? Those are all comprehension strategies that require intentional use of it, right? Now, there are some elements of comprehension that really become skills so automatized that we don't do it naturally. So like schemata theory tells us that we can get discourse structures and they're so automatized that nobody's thinking, oh, that's the character. Oh, that's the problem. That's how he feels. Like you're, we're not applying a specific strategy, but it might go through the process of learning a strategy, applying it intentionally, and then it could become uh, uh, automatized, right? Sorry, Doug, it looked like you had a comment or thought about that. Well, I, no, I love the distinction there. And I do appreciate though, that you are bringing up some of the nuance, right? Because that schema theory is definitely a, a I feel like it is a skill that becomes automatized, which is essentially the definition of a schema, essentially. Um, I, I, uh, I wanted to actually bring us to a little comment on Facebook, if that's okay. I'm always perusing Facebook. This is probably unhealthy. I don't know. Um, but I want- That's I wanted okay. To- that's, that's when I know you're on the toilet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, not always. I'm on Facebook all the time. Um, so, uh, Okay, I want to know what people think about this. Someone on Facebook asked, what should I do to monitor comprehension in young students? And um, how should I do this? And people would say things like, oh, you should measure their oral language, which was amazing, right? But one person said, "Uh, you don't need to do it at all. Like, let's say for a kindergartner, because phonemic awareness and letter identification predict reading comprehension. So why do you need to measure oral language anyways? What's, so I'm curious about what this group thinks about that, that comment. Um, in which universe and which studies show that? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, there is no evidence that that is actually a factual thing. So there's also a difference between things that predict and things that are pre-skills right? Like letter naming predicts a whole bunch of stuff, but it is actually not necessary to be able to decode the words, right? You need the um, letter sounds, that kind of thing. That's a very significant and unsubstantiated leap to reading comprehension because reading comprehension is the most, you know, complex skill. After that, we're pretty much straight into writing and written composition, etc. It's easier to make that unsubstantiated claim regarding reading fluency. And it's also going to be incorrect because what actually predicts reading fluency is that your performance and the ran ras tasks, which has been proven all over the literature. That's, that's so, another predictive skill that's not a preschool. Right. Because phonemic awareness is lovely. It is important, but it is would be more predictive regarding possibly phonics, but we're not even going to reading fluency in that respect. 
So there is a lot involved, and this is where you know a lot of misconceptions about re regarding the science of reading and what it is. It goes all go goes back to it. Mm -hmm. Where that yeah. comma would come from? I, I think it comes from, sadly, probably some of the studies I've done myself. So, uh, you know, I mean, what we run into, and it's totally true, is that reading comprehension assessments, quote unquote, reading comprehension assessments in the early grades are completely constrained by decoding. So it is totally predicted by decoding. So I can see where that would be a something that someone would say. I totally think in some ways that's legitimate based on the science that we have. But I think what's tricky is where we are constrained by decoding. So as Doug and Trina know from their own measure, if you just take the decoding off and measure language comprehension, that's then then we do find that all these other skills like comprehension monitoring can have a predictive effect. But when you put, you know, when you put that constraint on, so I kind of I feel for those who are you know muddling through muddling because I have to do it myself too, the all the work that's out there, and there's just so much measurement that's overlaid on top of this. I think I find it to be really tricky um, from a scientist's point of view, let alone. If, when I was a clinician, I can't even imagine doing it, to be honest. I, I think it's really tricky. But Tiffany, that's a misrepresentation of your study. That was a really good study. What is it? To a circa 2004, Todd, Li Todd Little spearheaded it, right? Yeah. Well, kind of. I was thinking more about the work I've done on the Simple View and showing. Oh, okay. the simple, yeah, like the Simple View with Hugh, which is really, he's the leader oh, I of the work. But it's still a misrepresentation because you, you have to look at the big picture. You cannot use one study as a, you know, pure definition of everything. You have to, I mean, we're all, you know, we all, we all have to synthesize the information in order to come up with something that makes plausible sense. So I think that was a really fine study. And I think it was an incredibly helpful study because it actually assisted people with understanding what do you do with respect to phonemic awareness intervention? And what do you supplement phonemic awareness intervention with if you're reading beyond the second grade level, but still have significant orthographic mapping difficulties or decoding difficulties? So I think that's, you know, I think there's still some synthesis that has to be involved in this. And it was a really fine study. Well, thank you. I appreciate that so much. And you, you know, that you read it. <laughs> I appreciate that you even remember it. It's so kind. I read it. I referenced it. <laughs> but that's the course. We do have this fundamental misperception of what the research says. And a lot of people have a very equivocal stance on this, where it should be more of an integration of things mm -hmm. versus just over reliance on one thing to blindly guide you, much like everything else in life mm -hmm. and in science, you know? One thing I found, this is a slight detour, but I think it's relevant here is that when I've talked about language comprehension, I'm curious if other people run into this too, I think that because the science of reading historically really came forward uh, more kind of on piggybacking on the reading wars of phonics versus whole language. Anytime I talk about language, I automatically kind of get thrown in the whole language mode. And mm -hmm. so it's like, oh no, you're talking about language. We're the science of reading people. We don't like whole language. I'm like, wait, hold on. I do share a word with that. I do. <laughs> it's a very crucial word. But it's like, I really truly feel sometimes like I'm the baby thrown out with the bathwater because I've gone to present to schools, for instance, and I'll have people on the side who will come to me and be like, I'm so glad you're here. I've been telling them whole language is the key. Yeah. And I'm, like, is, ah. is I'm like, oh, and then it's <laughs> like, oh, wait, hold on. I, that's not what I'm saying. And so I do think we have a, a represent a PR problem yeah. too, that I think permeates and is the background of the science of reading. I'd be curious to see if other people feel that way too. And, and, it, and I know this seems like a tangent, but it does tie to what you said, Doug, I think, because it's kind of like, this is the focus phonics. We're not talking about language. I don't know what you guys think about that. I think that, um, I think that Goff and Tumner, I think that they did us a disservice by calling things linguistic comprehension instead of language. 
I think that's very unfortunate. It is the exact same thing, uh, but you know they placed that that label on there, and and then Hollis Scarborough brought this up in the rope, which is beautiful. I mean, the model is beautiful, and it has more items under language than it does under decoding. If you if you know that visual of the reading rope, right? I mean, it totally puts language in its place where it belongs, which is in a huge place in that model. Um, but yeah, I think that that's part of the issue. And then people also, I just wanna add, people do think that, and I get this all the time, if I teach children how to decode with fluency, then they will understand what they're reading. I feel like there's an automatic comprehension that comes into play. And we have many, many professors, colleges of education, schools of education that essentially focus on that and teach that and emphasize that you should teach decoding first. That's the factor. And they also will bring up that I'm just going on here. I'm sorry, but they will also bring up that the reason why, <laughs> the reason why we have so many students reading um, poorly in this country is because of decoding. And they say, if we focus on decoding, we will fix the issue. I see that all the time. And I really, truly believe that is inaccurate. That is incorrect. Now, okay. it's partially correct, but not okay. at all the big picture. All right, Doug and Tiffany, I'm going to ask the question that you two just gave great answers to, because I think there are more answers to get. OK, and I already wrote down my answers, and you guys gave two of them. So, but. <laughs> My question that I want to keep talking about is why does decoding get emphasized? Tiffany says it's because language has the word language in it. And because of its origin, this, the science of reading is supposed to be the solution, the weapon in the, the reading wars against phonics and whole language. Nobody wants to use the word language because they think it's a concession. I totally believe that because I can read all of these articles about the science of reading and they very rarely use the word, okay? They say comprehension processes or things like that, right? And then I forgot what Doug answered, but it was another answer. I just like Tiffany's answer better. So, <laughs> so what a why, does, why does decoding get emphasized? Why? There are more reasons than the ones that they just gave us. It's a more successful meme. If we're to follow the work of Alan Cami on memes and meme flexes, language is far more complex. No one understands what it is, how to approach it, what to do with it. Decoding is straightforward. You know what to do, you know how to do it, you know how to, you know, move on from simple to complex. When it comes to more complex things, all of a sudden people are like, whoa, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carrie, Carrie Shea said the same thing in the chat. I, I, I listened to some of these science of reading um, podcasts and the whole episode supposed to be about science of reading. And it was like, it was like, you know, 55 minutes of phonics instruction and five minutes of saying, yeah, working on language comprehension is really hard and nobody knows how to do it. So let's move back to phonics. All right. All right. So what else? I Why also think that. I also think that when we talk about comprehension, I, I always think about reading comprehension versus oral language comprehension. And we all know that oral language is the key to everything, you know, practically everything that we do. And I, I think that distinction isn't made clear enough that a student has to have strong language comprehension in order to comprehend what they read. You know, Doug, what you were saying is we've, nobody thinks about these word callers. They, you know, they read beautifully, but they don't understand much about what they're reading. And that's, that's when you really have to think of all the, if you will, the comprehension strategies that you can think of to get at, at, at the problem. So I really think, again, reading is, reading is easy to teach. Um, mm -hmm. decoding, but again, decoding is easy to teach. right? Yes, but the thinking part of it is is just so hard. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Joyce, I would add that you're you're sort of juxtaposing language comprehension and reading comprehension in a sense, the way you're talking about it. But then, 
I think really it'd be better characterized to say that people don't understand just how much they are related because you're saying that it is language comprehension that is foundational, that it is absolutely required for reading comprehension to take place. And so, I, I mean, that, and that is your point. I know that's your point. And I've, to me, that instead of drawing a distinction between the two, that actually sort of merges those two more together, right? Understanding that oral language comprehension or reading comprehension can be mm -hmm. uh, synonymous, actually. Not always are, but can be. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to just talk really quickly about Samara's comment here. She, I don't know if you all can see it in the chat. She says, teachers want to pick up program, pick up and teach, easy to implement. They don't want to do the research. They don't want to find best practices themselves. They want an easy program. Phonics programs deliver that. And Samara, or Samara, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, but I mean, in some ways, everybody who is uh, working with children who has a large classroom, they need something easy, right? Because they're overwhelmed with the workload that they have. And it's not, of course, that, that teachers are lazy or they're not interested in evidence-based practice in any way, but they do need the research translated into a usable product for them. It, it, yeah, and into language that they, that they understand. <laughs> not just trolling, trolling through papers and papers. <laughs> exactly. So there's a brand new uh, article on the science of reading. It's called Four Forces That Modified, Distorted, or Ignored, Ignored, let me, I can read, or Ignored the Research Finding on Reading Comprehension, right? And it is specifically talking about the influence of publishers on curriculum and the and the transfer and how we got from the science to no instruction on language comprehension right it is very it's a very good read and highlights these exact things that you mentioned right that's by dewitts and graves it's just out in the very most recent um mm -hmm. uh reading research quarterly special yeah. issue it is a and fabulous article it takes you through the history of of reading instruction and and um and it kind of it just like trina said it highlights how comprehension has been distorted and left behind i think it's also to be honest i think there's some pre some clear prejudice too i've had many uh, i i shouldn't use i had four different encounters i can think of very explicitly early on in my career where top reading researchers told me that if a kid can read words and they can't understand, it's because they came from poverty, okay. that they have, they came from a bad background. And I, that, that really struck me early on in my career and has made a huge influence, those comments. The first one I received was in my doctoral program. And then I kind of sought this out from others. I was like, hey, what if a kid can read? If you ask some people, and this is, and these people actually have since retired, so I, I'm still not going to say their name, but I will say that they've retired. Uh, but I think there's some real serious prejudice there of not understanding what developmental language disorder is, not understanding neurobiological differences that children can have in language, and just blaming it on poverty. And we know what that really means when when people say that. So I think there's some really important aspects that need to be said aloud related to those factors and and i was just thinking you're not saying that's strong enough tiffany <laughs> they have biases against races and ethnicities that's what it is there is a there is a racial and ethnic bias there so yeah you're right about that okay so i still have a few more answers to my questions on my list i'm just wondering if anybody was on the last uh, comprehending comprehension episode, that's a hint. We had two state level speech language pathologists who worked at state level organizations and they were focusing on phonics, you know, doing, um, I just blinked, letters, training all throughout the state. And when we asked them about language and comprehension, they weren't doing much. So, so uh, Crystal, Crystal made a comment that's certainly related to this, uh, Crystal Alonzo talking about how assessment uh, measures and screening tools, they're easier to administer usually than comprehension. And uh, if you, I, I had the greatest time writing this paper with um, Ar Arlie Richardson, 
about the history of these progress monitoring tools for reading and um, and how they develop for, for focusing on reading comprehension and how uh, they're constantly trying to create a tool that can be administered to thousands of children quickly and efficiently and at low cost, yet while at the same time maintaining validity and reliability. And you can see this work by Stan Dino and, and Douglas Fuchs and others, and, and it's kind of persisted right through Dibbles and Ames Web and all of that, where they're trying so hard, they know they need to measure comprehension, but it's so hard to do in that efficient manner. And so um, decoding, is, decoding is very much a focus with the young children with those assessments. And I think that's part of the reason right there. Yeah, because the states are measuring decoding. That's like their, is that what you're saying? That's the connection? Yeah, because they can measure decoding efficiently and they have the tools to do it. And so they, that's, and like you always say, Trina, what gets measured gets taught or something like that. It's, Weighing a pig pay. doesn't make him grow, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta gets, in it too. gets taught. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> gotta go weigh that pig. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's good. Tiffany put a link into the LARC curriculum that's that's free. Very yes. good. Thanks, Tiffany. All right. Okay, so any more? I also think I have a couple more if you don't want to go there, but one of them is that um, let's see, we have a lot of turnover among teachers and like they may plan schools may plan to start with teaching phonics like this is explicit you know systematic phonics but we're going to get to comprehension and by the time they get there they have a whole new set of teachers to teach right the the professional development just takes a long time and it is not infused in our training programs so that's another you know that's an issue we need to work at it at the higher ed level for sure Hey, Trina, then, can we connect that to uh, Mary Coakley Field's comment in here? Because well, she's saying that there was a move away, like this whole language focus that Tiffany was talking about. There was a move away from explicit phonics instruction. And the science of reading has done so much good in bringing the focus back to that, right? And so the, the training can be done there. You look at the training that's happening at these levels and it's so much focused on decoding and it's good and it's important. But like you said, it takes a long time to train everything, all aspects of reading. It seems like the decoding part is getting trained first. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that there's some false uh, decisions. Like people think they have to choose decoding or language or decoding or comprehension or comprehension strategies or these other things, right? Or knowledge, sorry, knowledge is the other thing. It's knowledge or comprehension strategies. It's not, it's all of it in a comprehensive integrated way. I, a funny story, Doug and I, one of our very first districts that, that started doing story chants with this, it was uh, uh, the Wind Rivers Indian Reservation in Wyoming. And we taught them how to do story champs, taught them how to do it in a tiered fashion. And then they sh showed, you know, they had some success and then they're like, so should we be replacing our decoding instruction with this? And we were like, no, <laughs> no. So they were really ready to like abandon decoding instruction altogether because they had found this new thing and they thought this was gonna be the whole thing. And that's how, right? That was the first time we were like, holy crap, we need to work on our messaging here. <laughs> this kind of reminds me of some discussions about decodable text. And some people have actually said <laughs> with these de decodable texts, which are sometimes hard to get some comprehension work going because they're so simple. They say, well, you don't need to ask any question. You don't need to know if they're understanding, just let them read, which of course is incorrect. You, you, you know, you have to do it in tandem, I believe all the time. You're working on decoding and comprehension simultaneously. Joyce, I totally agree with you that both of those need to be worked on, but I don't think that they need to be worked on with the same text. And here's why. Decodable text does not have complex academic language, right? It's programmed and constructed so children can sound it out. Mm -hmm. But they need to be hearing and speaking a complexity of text that's way more difficult, right? 
So yeah. we would consider that a spoken text, right? Versus a written text that they can decode. So mm -hmm. they need to work on both, but in that very moment in those young grades, you have to separate them because the complexity of the text for those purposes are just so disparate. So what happens is we work, if we try to focus and we only give them simple decodable text, they're not being exposed to the academic language they need for comprehension. Well, you just said if, if that's only, I mean, I'm talking about being in a language rich environment where there's lots of academic language going on consistently where they're okay. getting that. And and I, I have no, but one of the lovely decodable texts is Flyleaf Publishing. And she does use, use new terms because she's trying to get decodable words, but so she'll use dusk instead of sunset. So you've got to do hmm. some language development in there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I get your point. Prina, I love what you said. Do you, is that, I've been saying the same thing, like just separate it, se don't use the same books, even though that sounds amazing that there's authors that are trying to get kind of two, you know, two things out of one set of books. Trina, do you know if that's written anywhere? You know, our one of our uh, community partners in Michigan would know this because she and I are the ones that have had long conversations about the difficulties they've had in mm -hmm. Michigan to because they keep trying to do comprehension with these decodable texts. Um, and I think she might have written something mm -hmm. about it. So I will check in with her and see if she has some references. Um, I'm not, I don't know that I've ever read that. I just know that from my own experiences of teaching reading, I would, I would never think. Basically what I would do is use a decodable text for phonics, explicit phonics, and give them connected text to read quickly, right? Don't just do a bunch of PA exercises without any kind of, you know, decoding, blending, uh, uh, you know, words and stories, but then separately, in the next 15 minutes or in the next half an hour, I would do oral retells, right? And in the oral text or the spoken text, that should be very, very complex. I don't mean long, I mean complex academically, right? Lots of subordinate clauses, relative pronouns, you know, elaborated noun phrases, high vocabulary, high interest vocabulary. And in fact, you know, that is our approach. We do it with narratives and expository text. So kids are talking in an exchange around really interesting things. Kids love it. And the kids who have dyslexia or other decoding problems can still engage with this really rich information orally, right? That's what I do. That's, that's, what, and that's do. what we did with our lessons too. We always chose books that were higher complex, usually two grades higher, because when you're looking at those complexity measures, a lot of them are decoding complexity. So we had to go two years higher to have it more of the language complexity they needed. I just haven't heard that written. So that would be great to get those resources. And I think it sounds like another paper you guys need to write, but I'm just- I was just gonna there. suggest you do it. I, I think but you- Clinically, it. this is what we do every day in the trenches. None of this is surprise to clinicians. This is what we do. I literally had two meetings of attorneys this morning with kids who are fantastic fluid readers, but are really poor comprehenders. And the question is, why the poor comprehenders and the, and the answer is poor oral language with a significant emphasis and pragmatic abilities. They have difficulty working their fantastic decodable text, but they have significant difficulties dealing with grade level text. So from a clinical perspective, it's actually crystal clear. So it would be lovely to, of course, have research on that, merging that with practice. But clinically, that's what makes perfect sense. You can't use a decodable reader to teach complex grade level text because the children are never going to be at the grade level. And that's one of the issues which comes up in litigation in a lot of the cases where the schools are trying to teach, use decodable readers to mm -hmm. teach something, which is absolutely not at grade level because that's not yeah. what you use to teach a sixth grader to read. Mm -hmm. Right, Tatiana, I mean, what you are talking about are it is a very real world problem that all of us who practiced in the field are so keenly aware of because like you said it is there in your face all the time you see people monitoring reading just using reading fluency or relying on reading fluency almost exclusively and then they realize after several years and that child is very fluent that that student actually doesn't understand very well what they're reading and they're confused because they think that reading fluency and comprehension are essentially the same thing or yield the same concept and they don't 
so yeah, you're right. And that's what drives, that's what drives a lot of us to go get our PhDs and do research, right? It's totally because there are real problems that we're trying to solve. So here's a perfect example from today, literally. I just finished an assessment of this uh, really highly intelligent, almost 12-year-old whose who's IQ is probably way higher than mine in the 130s. But here's a fascinating thing he was doing. His reading was really superb, quite flawless, perfect reading fluency. His reading comprehension was absolutely fantastic to assess because of this fantastic memory that he was literally regurgitating very complex level text. He couldn't understand one whit of what he was reading. So here's what he was doing when he was answering questions in the Gord 5. When I would ask him a question, he would produce an unrelated stream of consciousness signifying nothing, which sounded pragmatically bizarre. But he kept whispering to himself, you know, metacognitively and metalinguistically, oh, I memorized that. Huh. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad I'm recording you. Yeah. Because, and that's a perfect example of somebody with a phenomenal decoding abilities. I mean, he did a superb job. This is an 11 year old who can decode improvisation and respite and whatever words you can come up with. His reading fluency was really at a much higher level, but his reading comprehension was so significantly flawed. And the question was why? And the answer is, well, he does have very significant oral language deficits affecting his ability to comprehend metacognitive and metalinguistic language. Mm -hmm. So I wanna reserve time for the last two questions. Okay, because they're really good ones. Doug already said these are his favorite. Right. <laughs> I do. Can I ask the first one? This, Go for this it, question, I, I really like it. I think it's going to get us thinking. Um, so what will happen if the science of reading continues to minimize the contributions of language? To or reading? the application of the science of reading? What, what do you perceive will happen if we continue down that path of an underemphasis on language? It's continue, will continue to be significantly underserved. Grave errors in judgment will happen with respect to intervention services. Yeah. So there might be I some can... different, different answers with like the teachers versus speech language pathologists too. Like, I'd be interested. It could be maybe even a better question to ask on the positive side, you know, what would happen if oral language were emphasized more in the science of reading or applied more in this focus on the science of reading? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, Tiffany, you're right. Right. Ultimately, the science of reading will fail because what will happen is people will have all of this focus and all of this energy on decoding and explicit phonics, and they will have gone through all of the expensive trainings and they will feel so good about applying the science of reading with that focus on phonemic awareness and phonics. And then when it comes to measuring reading in fourth grade and eighth grade and 12th grade, and the students are asked to answer questions about what they're reading and they can decode it all, but they don't understand it, the scores will remain the same. And so people will say, oh, we got to go back to whole language, I guess, or whatever they're going to yep. do. I don't know. The pendulum will keep swinging and we'll have a new name for whatever it is. And we'll try it again. And it'll be phonics versus whole language decoding instruction again. And these okay. consequences are real. Hold on just one second. Right. These are very real. Like students who struggle with reading, the, um, their life is affected by that in many, many ways. I just wanna say that it's not just about test results, right? Like th this, is, this is impactful in individuals' lives and their ability to make decisions for themselves and have choices in their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we do about it? That's the final question, everybody. What do we do about it? <laughs> Joyce? I'm calling on you because you have been so talkative and I love your perspective. It's very different than ours as researchers. So I want to hear you. I think the responsibility becomes for people in the know and practitioners like myself to start bringing to light the importance of 
reading comprehension, that it isn't just reading the words on the page. It isn't about just fluency. We have to think about oral language all the time and relate that to reading text. And like Doug, what you said really depresses me a lot. I, I can't imagine going through another reading war. I, I, I really can't. Um, I shudder to think about that because I'm so proud of where people are going right now. But I, I do see your point that in some ways, I guess comprehension has been neglected. And there are some people um, like Nancy Hennessy, who really is a, a great um, expert on comprehension and does a lot with the science of reading. So I think I might have to contact her <laughs> and tell her to start <laughs> shouting out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joyce, I think that's good. So I'm just kind of reading the chat. It's so good, really good examples about building better partnerships, unifying our messaging, um, advocating, having language professionals in, more involved in the reading instruction in schools. All of those are awesome. I think, uh, uh, Lois, I'm not 100% sure what your suggestion is, but it might be making sure that teachers receive better materials, more integrated curriculum that actually has all of the science of reading integrated into it, right? And we shouldn't be leaving the development of curriculum up to publishers. And that right there is a problem, right? What about involvement in the International Dyslexia Association? Because there's a very significant point there because International Dyslexia Association focuses on certain aspects of reading and it certainly is not reading comprehension or oral language to the extent we want it to focus there has to be very significant lobbying efforts to deliver that message across. If we are not reaching out to certain entities which are in charge of spreading that message, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. You are so right, Tatiana. And that just really aligns with the comments that you see in the chat. It, it is on us, it behooves us as speech language pathologists who understand language assessment and intervention to do something about it. And I, I really always put RSLPs on a pedestal here. And I don't know if it makes them feel comfortable or not, but I mean, when it comes to language assessment and language intervention approaches, they're pretty much it. I mean, yes, you will find some people in other fields who understand these things to a certain degree, but nothing like the sort of education and experience that speech language pathologists have. So just like Tiffany said, it's on the SLPs and Tatiana, we need to, we need to advocate for ourselves because we hold such a huge key, a huge piece to the puzzle. Yeah, but I wouldn't count out the teachers, right? Because think about this, even like good decoding requires language skills. Those are metacognitive, language skills, they might be more basic ones than things like vocabulary and narratives and whatnot, but those are language and we can teach language constructs. It can be taught. Heck, I learned them. I'm not an SLP, right? I learned them. And I believe that teachers can be taught just like they can be taught, you know, Scarborough's rope, and the emphasis on the decoding side, they can be taught Scar Scarborough's rope and what's on the other side. Like that can be done. And I believe every teacher is a language teacher first and foremost. So we got to prepare them better. Yeah, well, let's do it. It looks like we're pretty much out of time, but I think that's a great place to end, right? I mean, let's do this. Let's let people know what we know about language and share that knowledge. And um, yeah, you let's know. not be afraid to say it. Change the language, world. but I don't mean whole language. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank hey. you, everyone, for joining us today. Okay, good. All right. We'll do a summary and we'll post it on the Facebook page. And we are this close to having the blog up and running. So it's going to happen also, soon. Um, don't forget to share this information in the, in the SLPs for Evidence Based Practice group. Because when you talk about reaching wider audiences, 55,000 members. How much wider do you want? 
<laughs> right, Tatiana, I really do want to shout out to your group. If you guys aren't a member of that group, you need to join it. It is fabulous. And I just want to say Tatiana does a great job moderating that group also and keeping things focused on evidence-based practice. It's beautiful. So do join that and spread the word that language is incredibly important. Yes. And Sorry, what was the name? Sorry, what was the name of that group? It's SLPs for Evidence-Based Practices group here. Let me send you a link in the chat option before we all say goodbye. Simply because. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's simply because we try to keep it real there. Oh, so Nikki is already on top of that. <laughs> what a <laughs> mother. She's so on top of everything. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so good. Thank you. There were so many people on the call today. Not everybody was engaged talking with their phone or with their video on, but many chatted. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And I also want to say, this is a, just an extra shout out to our group. We had teachers we had behavior analysts, speech language pathologists, reading specialists. So you are a diverse group and I am really happy you're all here. We need to hear everybody's voices because we all have some responsibility in teaching these kids. Okay. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you very much.